Welcome to Revelation Reimagined. My name is Darren Croft and joining me from the far end is Michael Mahanu, Peter Hughes and Roman Halupka. And we are four Adventist pastors that love to study, read and discuss the book of Revelation, which we are going to do with you today. Today we delve into this fascinating book of Revelation that talks about the end of the world. It talks about Jesus and it, it speaks to our lives today. And so last session, we were digging into Revelation 14 and these three amazing messages that are for the whole world, that are a call to worship Jesus, to accept the gospel, and then a bunch of warnings about what happens if we don't take that path. Now we dig into Revelation 15 and 16 today. So as we've invited you previously, if you haven't had a read of these two chapters of Revelation yet, just hit pause, have a read through them, and then come back and join us ready for the discussion. So as we look at the, the, the big picture of loyalty from chapter 14, we discover you know, some of these themes of loyalty and rebellion, light and dark continue to play out through chapter 15 and 16. Chapter 15 is a backdrop scene to the seven plagues. This is a judgment scene in these chapters. So I want to turn to, to my colleagues here with me and I'm going to direct it to you, Peter, first. Tell us about this backdrop scene and where this fits in Revelation. Yes. Thanks, Darren. In, as a backdrop, the book of Revelation is generally understood to be divided into two halves. The first half, chapters 1 to 11. The second half, chapters 12 to 22. But each half is also divided again by colour. There are four horsemen, and each horseman has a specific colour. The first section is important because it shows the purity, the truth, the light of God. So white is the colour associated with that episode of the first half. The second episode was red, which is symbolically sin and bloodshed. That comes through to the end of chapter 11. Chapter 12 through to 16 is black. Black is the opposite of white. White is purity and truth. Black is darkness and apostasy. And then the final colour, the colour of uh, everlasting death or uh, eternal death is the pale colour of death. So four colours. We have looked at white, we have looked at red. Red is warnings of judgment and the chapters that we're looking at today are the actual description by God of, that, of those judgments. So, so these judgments, so very clearly we're into judgment phase in these chapters and what you're saying then is they also are then going to connect into the next session where we get into Revelation 17 to 19. Yes. Um, and they're both, both really judgment pictures. Yes, but they also connect back to the white and the red. Mm -hmm. So when, when we looked at chapters 8 through to 11, we were talking of the warnings that God was giving, that if you are a sinner, if you... Uh, go contrary to his love and his law, then there is a consequence. So those warning judgments are, or those warnings of judgments are fulfilled in what we're going to talk about today. Mm. Mm. So the, the, the whole question of judgment's an interesting one because sometimes we end up quite fearful of the, the idea of judgment. And I think this will you know, we'll, we'll talk a bit more about this as we go through these, these two chapters. Um, Michael, judgment from your end, is judgment all about darkness and fear? What's, what's the story with judgment? It's, it's so interesting actually to read in the book of, uh, of Revelation, um, the fact that only God calls for, for judgment. 
God and his people are calling for judgment. We'll never see Satan and his demons and his allies calling for just, uh, judgment. And we know that you know only innocent people go because um, they, they, uh, they are wronged. Uh, other people are, are, are doing bad things to them and they need justice. They need judgment because uh, they need their, their names to be cleared. Um, so we, we see here the people of God actually looking forward to the judgment. Uh, those That's people certain. that have been mistreated, those people that have been uh, um, oppressed, uh, persecuted, tortured. And we see along the ages, um, you know, Jesus said, starting from Abel, mm -hmm. you know, start the generation. It starts from Abel all the way. God's people have been persecuted. Uh, we read in, in uh, Revelation chapter 9, verse 6, with their souls under the altar, the same image that the people of God are calling. So for those people that have given their lives to Jesus, judgment is liberation, it's freedom. Um, and this is why uh, they, they are looking forward. It's something, it's like a reward, it's something that they, they can't wait until this judgment takes place. So. Um, from from our perspective, there is nothing that we are afraid of. Mm. There is nothing that we are afraid of. Just judgment. Uh, it's always for in favor of God's people, not against God's people. So it's just the perception that some sometimes it's it's very dangerous, and we need to go back to the Bible and understand exactly um, how things are. Mm. Uh, yes, I, w I would like to add, because that was from the perspective, uh, Michael, that you said, from, from the people who are suffering, they are innocent. But, you know, at the same time, judgment for me is unusual privilege for, for those people just to prove who is God. Mm. Because we have to re we have to remember that that God was uh, uh, that Satan created completely wrong picture of of God in the whole universe. He wanted to to accuse God for everything. So who can prove? God can prove doing just saving us and and if we accept it. But our decision is just uplifting God and showing mm. uh, who is He really. So so judgment. Well, it's not only, you know, the, the hope and privilege for us, uh, but, you know, it just enables us to be the real proof for God, Absolutely. to prove who is He. And, and that's, uh, uh, for a long time, you know, I was scared of judgment, as usual, we don't like this word. But, but now, as, as I think about judgment, so it's not only good news. That's, that sounds strange, but you know, uh, good news for, for people who are saved. But you know, what a privilege to say, what God I believe, uh, and I know, and I let him to, to influence my life, and I can prove, yes, he is righteous, because I'm saved. Mm. Yeah. It's an interesting angle, isn't it? Because yeah. we, we often, well, I've often thought of judgment in terms of this is about me. Yeah. And there is an element of that that's true, but the bigger picture is a lot of people have misjudged God, as you've said, Roman, and this is actually yeah. an opportunity for that to be put right. Yeah. We can personalize it, can't we? If, if you are prepared to stand in what you believe is true and right, in the, and people treat you unjustly for what you make your stand on, mm. God will, in the end, vindicate your stance. Mm. So if you, if you take, make the choice, I want to do what is right to other people, then God will support you in that stand. Mm. Mm. If I may add just one sentence, you know, uh, uh, talking about judgment, we have to think who is the judge. And you know, the judge is our savior. Because God the Father has given everything into the hands of His Son. So at the same time, I can understand because 
God was. God the Father was accused. Mm. So he's not judging himself. He gave it to his son. And his son is our friend. So, well, why to be scared of a judgment? Yeah. Only on mm -hmm. one condition. If we have a bad relation or no relations with Jesus. Yeah, the judge is on our side. Mm -hmm. I think we need to have uh, another session just on judgment. Oh. <laughs> it's such a good topic. But yeah. we'll come back to it because yeah. we're in, in chapter 20. Yes. All right, it's part of that chapter is, is this, this judgment. Uh, and what, what is interesting is that, you know, I heard people <coughs> saying, oh, I hate thinking of in the judgment, all my, my bad things, you know, the dark side of me will come to light. And, but that's not true. Mm. We are forgiven in Jesus Christ. And in, in chapter 20, actually, God's people don't come into judgment. Yeah. They, yes. All right. So, so the, this is because because we have given our life to Jesus, He has forgiven our 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 uh, uh, sins and shortcomings, and uh, we we have no fear of judgment. We don't come into judgment in a sense that uh, the, the bad people will come into judgment according to Revelation yeah. 20. There's so much more we could <laughs> explore on this one, but we, we'll, we'll leave it there, except for, I, I'm going to add a comment. Um, I, I've been to court a few times as character witnesses for people, and I've seen people found guilty, and I've seen people declared not guilty. And for those that go through the court process and at the end are declared not guilty, there is nothing more liberating and freeing than for them to walk out and it's, yeah. you know, they, they could leap buildings yeah. in a single, you know, a single leap sort of thing. And the, the judgment picture here has both those aspects at, at play, doesn't it? So yeah. anyway, we've got to keep moving. Revelation 15. We're going to read a couple of verses here. So from 15 verse 5 through to 8. And it says there, after this, I looked and I saw in heaven the temple, that is the tabernacle of the covenant law, and it was opened. Out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues. So this is the judgment picture. They were dressed in clean, shining linen and wore golden sashes around their chests. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. So, interesting picture that it's giving us here of not being able to enter the temple. What is the significance of the temple filled with smoke? I think this is where the key is of understanding chapter 15 and 16. Yeah. If we understand uh, the significance of what happened in the temple, why there is the smoke, and again, it's unavoidable that we have to go back to, to the Old Testament because there are two instances when it happened exactly the same. Yeah. So when we uh, analyze as those... In, as in smoke... Smoke filling the, temple. filling the yeah. temple and what happened there. And when we look actually in what happened in, in that uh, uh, situation, actually we, we extrapolate and understand the meaning of the heavenly temple that is filled with smoke. And I will let the others Yeah, yeah. All continue. right. Anyone want to build on that? Well, it's suggesting that if the temple is full of smoke, then people can't enter that temple. Which seems a fair assumption, yes. doesn't it? And yes. that's what Michael is alluding to in yep. the Old Testament. The priests couldn't go into the temple. And if in this situation the temple is full of smoke, it means that no priest will enter the temple. And if no priest enters the temple, there is the, the forgiveness aspect of being able to bring your sins to the temple and have them forgiven has ceased. Yep. It has mm -hmm. ended. It is saying that probation for mankind has ended. So there's, there's, I guess when we think about judgment, and we will come back to this in, in a future session, there's different phases of judgment. What we're seeing is now a change in, you know, symbolically in what is able to happen in this heavenly temple. Mm. Michael. And, and 
we probably uh, we have to add this detail um, because we know that when Jesus went up to heaven, he started his work of intercessory, all right? Hebrews chapter 4, chapter 7. Uh, these are talking about uh, the, the heavenly w uh, ministry of Jesus as interceding for us. Yeah. So if Jesus is finishing his intercession for us, for sinners, this has great impact and consequences of what's happening on earth. Yeah. All right, because we know that the, uh, when Jesus entered uh, the heavenly sanctuary to start his intercession, the Holy Spirit was sent and uh, the, the Pentecost took place and the, the great, uh, you know, spread of the gospel and people started to realize that they are sinners, they need Christ, they need to forgive, to ask forgiveness for their sins. So if all these things are not possible, that means the Holy Spirit is withdrawn from mm. the earth. The, the implications uh, of this are massive because we know that the Holy Spirit is the one that keeps the balance between good and evil and, and keeps the forces of evil like, in, like, like they were restrained. Like the waters, yeah. Hmm. Yes, so if the Holy Spirit is not present on earth uh, and the forces of evil have full sway and full control on people, it's just hard to imagine what is going to happen there. Hmm. And ju just by the fact that the Holy Spirit is withdrawn is a plague in itself. Yeah. And automatically what follows is a result of the fact that God has ceased his work on this earth. Mm. So it's, it's really setting up the scene for, for these plagues, isn't it? Because, and if somebody wants to, if you want to check out those passages where the temple in the Old Testament is filled with smoke, have a look in Exodus chapter 40, particularly verses 34 and 35 and also 1 Kings chapter 8 and around verse 10. You can, you can have a look at those for yourself. So these plagues then, as, you know, as this scene is set, these plagues, Peter, seem to be poured out one on top of the other. Is that how you take that? I take it that they are cumulative. Mm. I take it that they are symbolic and God is laying out the seven steps involved in the process of the judgment. Mm. You don't read them as individual and separate. You read them as a, a cumulative effect. So it's not that one starts and then stops and there's a pause and then another no. one starts mm. and stops. It's, it's just... Yeah. Yeah, they, mm. The first one was that a, a fearsome or newsome soul would be poured out on men. Satan, when he was... Um, punishing Job for his faithfulness to God, brought boils over his whole body mm -hmm. as, his first, as his first punishment to Job. Well, God's got a sense of humour because the first plague that is brought out is a newsome sore, a boil over all of the people who are, who've listened to Satan. Um, the second one, the second point in this sequence is that all of the people in the sea died. Now, we've been explaining to you as we have gone through this series that in Scripture, sea represents people, multitudes, nations. And if everyone in the sea dies, who's left for the other five plagues that are going to be poured out? Yeah. I think they are the sequences if you are a sinner and under Satan's influence you can expect each of these things to Ultimate happen. outcomes. Mm. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so, Roman, one of the things I notice is the, the, the plagues here, uh, they're, they're unlimited in how they're poured out, but they're not poured out on everyone. Well, the idea of the plagues, again, we can learn something from the Old Testament. Because as God sends plagues to, to, in Egypt, to Egyptians, he wanted to teach them at the same time something, mm. to show them something. So each of the plague was attacking some of God's, some of their customs, uh, uh, and and you know that that was something what uh, what showed them that their religion is nothing. So it's an attack. It doesn't on work at all. It's a response to their gods. So we can expect in the same way that God is well. That's not the way of correcting people now that's too late and that's what we mentioned before but at the same time to show them to mm. show them where did you go 
You see what that's the result because that's that's something interesting that all of the plaques that will probably go through uh, very soon. So so they they are just pointing to their mistakes, to their wrong teachings, to to everything what what has to be changed, had to be changed. Too late, too late. So it's almost as much a consequence. Yeah. Yes, as, that's a consequence. As, as much as anything. Absolutely. Because I think. Coming back to the judgment thing, there's a there's a passage in Isaiah where it talks about judgment being God's strange or alien task, and so I don't mm. think this is something that God mm. sees happen with any sense of relish. He's mm. reluctant because mm. he wants as many as possible to be saved. Now I've just got a graphic we want to share with you here that gives the the the, the spread through Revelation, and Peter, the, the colours you you love to you know draw our attention to the colours, which is good. Um, just walk us through this graphic briefly. Well, it's as I mentioned at the beginning of this session, there are four colours, white, red, black, and the pale colour of death. White in the book of Revelation covers the first seven chapters, and it is highlighting who the I am was, and it is highlighting the significance of God's law, and that, and the people who uh, succeed in understanding that are given white robes of righteousness. But people who have understood the white of righteousness have come out of the fact that we're all sinners. And sin is represented by the colour red and the colour of bloodshed. So from chapters 8 through 11, God is warning people if they are sinners they need to change. Yeah. If you're a sinner and you have things that you are guilty about, you've got a choice. You can turn towards the white and embrace Christ and the forgiveness of God, or you can continue in your sin, which will lead you into apostasy, the colour of black. Yeah. And darkness. chapter yeah, yeah, darkness. And, and chapter 12 was the introduction of Satan into the book of Revelation, so you can go towards the white or you can go towards the black. And then if you continue in the red of sin and the black of apostasy, the end result of that is going to be the pale colour of death, yeah. endless death, yeah. from which there is no coming back. So I think it's, it's just good to see that again in the context of, you know, this is where we are sitting in Revelation at the moment. So we, we, what we're doing is trying to connect it where it fits in Revelation, but also in the broader picture of Scripture. So we're saying the, the ten plagues that fell on Egypt are a forerunner, if you like. Mm. The first three, of course, fell on everyone, and then the last seven just fell on the Egyptians. Um, there's, there's a couple of other parallels that we see here in terms of judgment pictures. Michael, Roman, do you want to... Uh, so definitely we find uh, the idea of plagues somewhere else in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And again, we need to go back to the Old Testament to understand the concept there and then to extrapolate and find it in the book of Revelation. Um, so the ten plagues of Egypt, right? Uh, just the number is different, uh, mm -hmm. ten <laughs> and seven. But what is interesting, when we put uh, those two side by side, we notice that the first three plagues of Egypt affected the people of God as well, mm. interestingly enough. But the seven, they did not touch. They are just only on the, um, the enemies of God's people and uh, the, the Israelites didn't, were not affected. Um, so we understand that actually the seven last plagues, they are just seven minus three, because no plague will touch on the people of God. So while the whole world in, in a, a turmoil and commotion and suffering, God is keeping his people safe and they are not affected. They are affected in a certain degree because we have to connect it with, with um, uh, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. There will be a distress like never has ever been on this earth but not in a sense that they experience the, the judgment uh, that comes through the plagues. So, so trumpets, of course, you know, trumpets are a symbol of judgment also through the Old Testament. Roman, you were going to 
I know, I just wanted to say, Michael has mentioned everything, you know, what should be here? <laughs> but, 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 you know, nothing to add. Uh, but, well, I, I'm still thinking, you know, about this, uh, not making the impression that we have the pleasure of just talking so much about the judgment, this punishment of, uh, that God sends. Uh, that's a tendency, you know. Uh, I know that, I believe that we are on this victorious side. Uh, but... <laughs> Are those people who are going to be saved are really so so satisfied with this? Oh, not satisfied with the coming of the Lord, but God will now punish them. They were waiting. God reacts, do stop our sufferings, yeah. but not not necessarily. You know, just just punish them, kill them, do it. Well, the people who who are touched by the love of God never think in such a way and and that's that's something what is important we have to we have to remember but anyhow that's good that we have to go through those plagues and we have to realize you know uh, how god is reacting and that's the purpose of it what you mentioned that's the purpose that's that was showing something roman my friend doesn't god tell us if somebody does something to hurt or harm you don't seek vengeance don't yeah. don't try and Absolutely. take vengeance yourself yes. He says, I will avenge. Yeah. And this is what we are yeah. talking about now, isn't it? God revenging all of the hurts and the harm that exactly. you have experienced in your life from other people. We're just yeah. handing it to God, everything. It's probably one of the hardest things for us to do as Christians when Jesus says, love your enemies and pray. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Uh, easy to say. Yeah. Um, but to, to surrender that to God and say, God, you sort this out. Um, that's that's yes, the picture. Exactly. The, the other one, of course, that we connect it to, that's a, a bit of a, a background to these seven plagues, is the Israelites and the, the fall of Jericho. Mm. So, you know, God said to, to Joshua, who was leading the Israelites at that, start, that time, you know, walk around um, Jericho for seven days and then... Of course, on the seventh day, that I walk around seven mm -hmm. times, and on the final time, I yeah. blow the trumpets and mm -hmm. shout, and the walls fell mm -hmm. flat. And, uh, and this helps us a little bit in the way where we place the plagues. All right, so we place the plagues all together right at the end of time. So we have the seven seven trumpets, and they don't overlap. The seven trumpets and the seven plagues they don't overlap. They're different. So in Jericho, for, for seven days, they had to go once. Six days. Uh, for six yes. days and the seventh day, yes. the seventh day, seven times. So there is a distinction between, you know, what they had to do uh, during the week and then on the last day, seven times. Mm. And that was the final warning. Mm. The destruction was going to come. And this is what we see in the book of Revelation. Yeah. The, the, the trumpets... Uh, that extend over a period of time, and then the plagues right at the end. Okay, so let's let's run through the plagues, and again we're remembering that these haven't happened yet. This is this is future. Um, we've been working with Revelation being you know full of symbols, and so we we have to be a little bit humble that some of this might play out literally. Some of it may. Be symbolic of something greater than what's being described um, but let's just go through so plague number one is poured out on the land and the earth peter's already picked up on the fact yeah. that there's a connection to job with boils anything you want to add on that one? Oh, i would like to add something <laughs> that's the question it's interesting that the four the first four plagues they have something in common Mm -hmm. God is taking back the blessings that he has given to humanity through a fertile land. I mean, where do we have the food? Mm -hmm. Have you had the breakfast? Have you had lunch? Where do you have the food from? From the, from the fruit of the earth. The earth is giving. So God is taking back the blessings that he has given to, to humanity uh, in the, the fruitfulness of, of the earth. And then in, in the sun. Uh, and then in the waters, the sea and the rivers and all these things that give us water, fresh water. Uh, so he is taking back the blessings that he has given to humanity. And Jesus actually tells us that uh, 
the, he, God gives us the, the rain of the good and bad, and He's blessing everyone, but there is a time when those blessings will be taken away, and the humanity have to, to experience actually what it means not to live under God's grace, under God's blessings. So, so not so much a picture of God bringing plagues on our heads, but it's actually God's absence. He, he takes what is His. He takes what is His. Yeah. It's like we are disobedient children, like a child that is rebellious, and the parent continues to invest love, continues to appeal, continues to offer him shelter, food and clothes and everything, and the child is just rebellious and rebellious, and there is a time when the parent says, all right, what's enough is enough. Yeah. You are on your own now. I can't give you any more. And that's the Heavenly Father that he has been blessing humanity in spite of the fact that we are rebellious. Uh, and there is a time when God, God says, I'm taking back what is mine. Now see what will happen. So we talk about his restraining influence being removed in yeah. that sense. Yes. So, so plague number one is you know, poured out on the land, on the earth. Plague number two on the sea. Plague number three on the rivers and the springs, verses four to seven of chapter 16. Plague number four is poured out on the sun. That the sun actually represents the light or the, the major source of light in the world. Mm -hmm. The secondary source is the moon and the third source is the stars at night. Mm. So he pours out, he pours out this plague on the major source of light. But many people actually worship the sun indirectly and not realize it because they, they set aside instead of the Sabbath rest the day that God asked people to, to acknowledge the God of the sun and worship and rest on the day of the sun. Mm. So it's an interesting piece of history that even Dan Brown in, in his novel picks up on that very thing and mm. um, some interesting mm. history on that one, isn't there? Yes. And, and you could say, you know, under that, that sun, they have rejected the light of Christ and, you know, therefore... <laughs> You know, how, how literal we read this, I, I don't know yet, but mm. they've rejected the light of Christ and so now they're burned by the sun. Um, yes. He's, he, it's an irony, isn't it? It is. People worship the sun, so God takes away the blessing of the sun and it, it, it becomes a horrendous drought condition and people are, are being troubled by the agony of too much sun. And that in you saying, all right, well, you wanted to worship the sun. This is what the sun can do to you. Yeah. And the other thing that I notice here is, you know, compared to the partial judgments earlier in Revelation, it covers similar territory. But the earlier ones, it was a third of this and a third of that or a quarter. And yeah. whereas now it's it's poured out without measure. Mm. And so there's there's clearly yeah. a, you know, a bigger uh, bigger impact here, Michael. And I think we see in these plagues um, uh, an increase. So every time, uh, so the first is on the land, and there is an increase to the sea, and there is an increase to the rivers, there is an increase to the sun where nobody can, nothing can escape to the sun. So I, I think they, there is an increase. It's interesting that, you know, it, it it's a mixture of symbolism and and literal literal application of the place. Yeah. Symbolically literal? Literally Symbolically symbolic. literal, <laughs> yeah. So if we think of the literal and we think that that every plague in Egypt actually hit a certain a certain god uh, of Egypt proving that that god is unable to protect its own people. And if we take that view, it's, it's interesting, actually, the conclusion that we reach with the, with the plague, because the first plague uh, is a plague of disease. And I mean, science and medicine today is just amazing. It's yeah. just amazing science and medicine. My, my dad just uh, had a cataract operation and just amazing to see now he's seeing better and he's it's what miraculous. science is just miraculous so so to to have a disease that there is no cure for and we we all rely on medication on doctors on hospitals and to be 
in that situation where no one can help you, there is no cure for, for this type of disease. Uh, and to be like a pandemic on everyone, just, you know, we just passed the, the, the COVID situation and how terrible it was. So add, multiply that by 10, by 100, and you'll understand, you know, the physical aspect of this plague. And again, if we take the sea, what is happening on the sea? Uh, the Suez Canal was blocked just for a few days, yeah. and they had <laughs> they had billions of dollars lo loss mm. in revenue. Billions of dollars. Uh, I can't remember the figure. Uh, I looked it up. Uh, um, the idea is, and I, I I think there's like more than 300 ships, commercial ships, waiting with merchandise to pass through the canal. We don't know actually how how. Um, important so the sea the the oceans are for us in transport mm. in taking merchandise from one place to another so if that will be blocked and the sea will not be uh, the vehicle to to transport imagine the the impact the consequence for humanity uh, so again we we take every single plague and we'll see there is a God that we worship too. There is a God that we worship to, and that will be taken away from us. Yeah. What would be, for example, the sun to, inc to scorch the earth? I mean, we live in Australia. Yeah. You, you know, we know what it means uh, just to have bushfires, uh, to have electricity cut off because the electricity, uh, the, the infrastructure can cope with, with the pressure of air conditioning. And just imagine the the the... Uh, the pain, the suffering, and how many people die because of the heat uh, strike, I think it's called. Um, so the practical implications of, of these plagues are, are hard to imagine. It's, it's disaster upon disaster. Isn't Correct. It? So let's, let's just touch on these last three plagues. So plague number five is poured out on the throne of the beast. Yeah. Plague number six is poured out on the river Euphrates, which happens to be the river that runs through... Babylon historically, which was the city of rebellion. Um, and then the seventh plague is poured out on the air and you get this final picture of catastrophic and universal collapse, which is ultimately a second coming picture. So let's just touch on the, these three plagues. And Roman or, or Peter, what do, you, what do you see with these three plagues? After you, Roman. <laughs> After me, okay. Well, that's the first one is attacking the throne of the beast. Mm -hmm. So, so that's a straight attack to to somebody who is well, not somebody because I will limit it to the person, but you know, to the system that was against God, fighting all the time. So, so the beast has claimed yes. the the place that belongs to God, and God yes. says, "Well, absolutely, that's 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 what happened." So, so. Then we see the, the reason, the purpose of this, you know, that's, that's attacking and um, completely uh, attacking this. And, you know, the, the next plague that, that is mentioned, you know, uh, this uh, Euphrates River, uh, that's you mentioned already, it was going through the ancient Babylon. And we have to remember that Babylon nowadays is just a symbol. So, so we are talking about the same area of this. Yes, Peter? The Euphrates was actually the boundary between God's people and the people that weren't God's people, and that. So the Euphrates is saying it's the Euphrates. The boundary is going to be removed in this sixth plague. There's going to be no boundary between God's people and those that aren't God's people. Well, the other element, of course, of of the history on that one was it was um, Cyrus who mm. diverted the Euphrates and enabled yeah. the Medes and the Persians to overrun Babylon. It was the, mm. the precursor, the preparation, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. And, and we, we uh, I guess, going back to what happened there, because that's where the initial story is. So we go back to the history, go back to Babylon. Yeah. Mm. Uh, uh, what, 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 um, what happened? What did it mean for, for Babylon? Uh, or for the people that were in slavery in Babylon, that the Persians came. So the Persians diverted the, the uh, Euphrates uh, waters, and then they went th through 
um, under the gates and they went and they, they conquered the city. Basically, nobody died because we know that the Babylonians um, accepted the Persians as liberators. So in, in that sense, we see here preparation for the second coming of Christ. Uh, we know that from the East, you know, the Magi came from the East, it's kind of this idea that from the East liberation comes. Um, the Persians came come from the East. Um, so in, in that sense, here we see preparation for the second coming of Christ. Is, hmm. is, we can see that you know, Christ God, is coming to, 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 yes, to, to free his people, to oh, free yes. his people. Uh, that are still in the world, and we'll see exactly because, uh, according to other interpretations, the church has been raptured, but uh, not not as we read in, in this uh, passage. So, yeah, we'll yeah. look into that doesn't more, it, yes. Doesn't it at the same time show that, you know, as Babylon could defend himself? You know, they, they had the circus, three circus of city walls, 16 and a half meters tall, high, uh, very wide. Mm. Uh, the three chariots could move, you know, yeah. on the top of the walls. The, they were so proud that they didn't defend it in the city, but who can overcome it? They never got the idea with this turning the river in, on the new riverbed. Uh, does it show us that, that, you know, the, in the last days, this power of the beast, mm will be so proud of itself, so sure of itself, yeah. that nothing can get. Uh, it just came to my mind one day as well, uh, one man attending the series of lectures that I conducted in Poland, and one day, uh, oh, for two t lectures, he was not present. And as he came back, I kindly asked him what's happened. And he said to, him, to me that he was curing people because, you know, I have this power. And while well, we started to talk, and there was such a pride, you know, I said, but Jesus is coming. We were speaking about this. Even Jesus will not touch me. He's mm. not able. I have the contact with the power of the universe. Uh, that, was, that was my reaction, exactly. I started to laugh at this because it's strange. But there is something in those people who are uh, in, in just rebellion against God. They are so proud and sure, so sure, we can manage, we'll do it. So that's the course that God decided to show them now. We, we see there's so much else in this symbolically. Oh, yeah. You know, we, we saw in the previous chapters the dragon and the two beasts. Well, they're now named more clearly here. You've got the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, because that second beast, oh. of course, takes the role of the prophet at directing worship to the first beast. So you've got the dragon, the beast, the false prophet. You've got this gathering for battle, you know, and we're not talking again, you know, a, a literal battle in terms of, well, it's a literal battle, but not a, a clashing of armies. Um, it's a spiritual battle that they're being prepared for. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons we know that is to do with this whole word that is here, Armageddon. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Armageddon is not a literal place. It's not. We have the plain of Megiddo and we have a mountain beside it, mm -hmm. but we don't have Ha, in, as I understand it means mountain, we don't have a mountain of Megiddo, so yeah. um, so so lots of symbolism here. Then we hit that seventh plague, with you know just a in in a way probably a frightening picture if you're having hundred pound hailstones fall on you, um, but very much a, a second coming picture, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. The seventh plague, the seventh trumpet, and the sixth seal all represent the second coming of Christ. Yeah. They are the culmination of all of what has gone before and the judgment that God is bringing on the world. Yeah. So I just want to, I guess, draw us back um, because we need to come to some final thoughts. We, we're at that point already, believe it or not. Um, in John 14, 29, Jesus says, I have told you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe. And I... I think giving us warnings of what's coming is an act of a loving God that wants us to know and to have the, the choice and to be able to make that choice to follow mm. him now. But gentlemen, final thoughts on these fascinating chapters. Michael? All right. 
there is something very important here that I can't, I can't uh, leave it aside. In the climax of this battle, there is an insertion. Mm -hmm. And we, we find this insertion again and again uh, to give hope to the people of God. And this is why um, uh, the understanding that the church is, um, the, the, the believers are in heaven just enjoying themselves and just looking and see what's happening there. Hello, goodbye, we are here. We are good. Can you see this is what happened to you because you're not good. But there is insertion, verse 15, Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. Here we don't have the understanding of people converted in the last minute. All right? Everyone will convert if they will have the opportunity. If they will, you know, uh, convert, you know, invert, inverted commas, because there is no conversion of the heart, there is a conversion of fear, if they will, if they will do it. Uh, but this verse is telling us uh, that this is the people of God. The people of God are keeping their clothes with them. Uh, they are ready, they are uh, still on this earth. Uh, they, they, they are deep in their faith in prayer and asking God to protect them uh, during the, the, the commotion that is taking place on the whole earth with the seven plagues. And, and this is the, 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 the blessing that is, you know, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake. Mm. Blessed. Are, and and this, is, uh, uh, this is the understanding that God has his people there. Um, uh, and in the middle of the battle, God is giving this blessing. You remain faithful. I'm still looking after you. I haven't forgotten you. Hang on. And I will come right away to take you to be with me. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Peter, final comment. The clothes Michael was talking about, we've been mentioning previously today and in previous sessions, the, the white robes of Christ's righteousness. You, your, your gowns, your clothes were filthy rags. But when you, when you have a faith and a belief in God and you do what he asks you to do, he clothes you with his righteousness. Yes. So the, the gowns, the clothes you were talking about were Christ's righteousness. Yeah. And they're your protection. Good. Yes. Hey. Roman, final comment. Yes. Uh, I always try to be very positive. And I never like, you know, concentrate on these bad things. Uh, so that's the reason I would like to come back to the first uh, verses, you know, especially uh, the end of verse 3 and 4 of 15th chapter. Because that's something positive. There are people who are saved. There are people who are on God's side. There are people who, who are singing great and marvelous, uh, I works, Lord God Almighty, just and true, I ways, O King of the saints. Well, they are the saints who are, who are singing it and saying it. Well, I would understand those verses in a different way if they would be in the end of the 16th chapter. Hmm. But they are not at the end of this chapter. God is not great because he's sending the plagues. God is not great because he's, well, he is great that he gave us the opportunity now to stay on his side. Yeah. And that's yeah. the last plague that says that he's coming. It can be disaster for many people, unfortunately, but it can be the, the best dream uh, came Comfort. into reality. That's what I dream. That's what I think. And that's the reason. <sighs> If I, if I try, I, I know, I know the plagues, I, I tell about it, I share sometimes, but I'm sharing more. The good news, that's something what we should concentrate all the time, what is important now. Thanks, Roman. I want to invite you, when we've finished here in a moment, I'll pray with you. Um, grab your Bible and go and have a read of Psalm 91 as God's mm. promise to us for when we get to these days and how he'll protect us. But let's yeah. pray now. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the warnings you give us in Scripture, for the hope, and even when there's darkness, it's always contrasted with the light of Jesus. So help us to take hold of the light and life that Jesus offers. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, next time we will be back in Revelation 17, 18 and 19, where we get to look at the woman, the beast and the fall of Babylon 
and there's a bit of dark stuff in there, but it's all about building to something spectacular and something really, really good. So see you next time.